Welcome to Doing Theology, Thinking Mission, where we talk about the biblical text in cultural context. Welcome to Doing Theology, Thinking Mission. Uh, my name is Werner, and I am joined with my co-hosts. Jackson. Hey, this is Carrie. And we have a very special guest today. His name is Tim Gombas. Jackson, let's do some further intro. You bet. It was, Tim, it was about 10 years ago that we first came to know one another. Because uh, for you audience that don't know, Tim was my external reader in my dissertation. I wanted That's right. I wanted a first-rate <clears throat> Pauline scholar to look at, look over my stuff. And... Uh, but you settled for me. <laughs> <laughs> I was so grateful. And your feedback was so constructive and so helpful and encouraging. Uh, I could tell like you actually read it and didn't just check a box off, you know? So for those of you who don't know Tim, uh, he was a professor for 10 years of New Testament at Grand Rapids Theological Seminary in Grand Rapids, having earned his PhD from the University of St. Andrews. His publications include The Drama of Ephesians and recently a commentary on Mark. He writes and speaks on Christian identity, biblical studies, books, movies, music, sports, so forth. And he has on his blog uh, and podcast by the same name, Faith Improvised. Uh, he loves the Chicago Cubs, but not as much as he loves his wife, Sarah, and their three kids. But he probably loves the Cubs more than his two twin cats. That's my guess. Depends on the day. Yeah, yeah. Is there any competition? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it definitely depends on the day. <laughs> now, Tim, on Amazon, you wrote, you said, there are 11 and very important things about me. And here are three of them. And you talked about teaching and you, you, have, an, you have incredible hand-eye coordination, you said. <laughs> and, huh? and you blog at Faith Improvised. What are a few of those other 11 things that are very important to know about you? Oh, man. I was written in a moment of silliness. I have a really hard time taking seriously uh, when people taking myself seriously when people write, you know, bios online and they do it in the third person. I just I have <laughs> such a struggle doing that. And I, I just feel like, you know, personality type, I, I know my personality type pretty well. And there's a high value and authenticity that just mm -hmm. feels just so slimy to me. Yeah. So I had to just, I couldn't take it seriously. I had to write something <laughs> stupid. No, I get it. I, uh, I do, I know the Enneagram and I do Enneagram one. So it's very much of like rules okay. and hey, okay, here's the boundary. So I, 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 I get yeah. that. So, yeah, I'm a Enneagram four. And so I, it's like, if it's not authentic and real, it's like, uh, this, uh, this just feels stupid. I don't want to do it that way. And also I don't want to follow. The that rules. makes a lot of sense in light of, I was looking back at your podcast. I'm like, yes, he is a four. I can see that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's probably pretty obvious in some ways. All right. Well, one of the things that is certainly going to grab the attention of our listeners is the title where we're going to, we're going to put in the title, you know, white theology. So we got so much to talk about. Let me just jump in with a question for you here. You said before, I heard you say before that you were interested in the topic of race. Cause you talk about race a lot in different interviews You that you like talking about it and thinking about it because it's helpful for you to explore your identity in Christ. Can that's not something I think a lot of people think of. They think, I like race because we want to overcome injustice and we want to love our neighbors. But can you unpack that a little more, how this helps you explore your identity in Christ? Yeah. Uh, I mean, I want to I want to think about and learn about race as much as I can because I do want to be very interested in doing justice in the wider world. And I want to love my neighbor and I want to have compassion. Um, but I think that one of the things I, I want to correct in myself and in my own thinking is to um, decenter myself and to, um, well, I'll, I'll, perhaps I could work with an image uh, that I, I think uh, Willie Jennings uses that I think is so helpful for me. Um, he talks about being gathered, be, we are all the crowd sort of being gathered to Jesus. And as we all sort of move toward Jesus, uh, you know, we look around and across, you know, at other people. And these are not necessarily people that we would naturally gather together with, but because we're all drawn to him, we end up standing shoulder uh, to shoulder with each other. And that puts us in community and we start learning about one another and that sort of thing. And um, what I have discovered in my own evangelical heritage is that we, that is we evangelical Christian people, have a way of talking that puts 
that puts us in the place of being patrons to other people. Mm. So like we need to learn about race so we can help them Mm. as if we're the ones who have it all together. And as if we're the ones who sort of are in charge of the God reservoir and we can dole out God to people who are in need. And that gets everything wrong. And especially if you look at things from the, uh, from the gospel of Mark, um, when Jesus tells the disciples, you know, as often as you welcome people like this, like you know, children, as often as you welcome a, a child, you are welcoming me and you welcome the one who sent me. And so what Jesus is saying to his disciples is like, you're not the ones who have me and you can sort of give me to people that have no social value, like children in that culture. When you welcome this person with no social capital or no, or no social value, you are actually welcoming me. Mm. So when to, to learn about race and to learn about injustice in our world, um, and for me to learn about uh, what it means to be a white person um, and to not be a person of color and what it means for me to be a man and not to be a woman and to be cisgender and not to be, you know, to fall in some other category of non-tradition, a non-traditional category when it comes to gender. It's hard for me to sort of think through where does my being a white person begin and end and where does my being a Christian begin and end? Because um, so much of what I have grown to understand about being Christian and my categories have all been shaped in white contexts. And I I never, this is kind of one of the ways that whiteness works. I would never have called them white contexts. I would have called them normal. This is just normal church. Mm. And um, I've come to see that the way that my world was ordered, the way that my imagination was ordered, has been so thoroughly shaped by whiteness and by just so many other values that we you know get from being westerners individualists capitalists i mean all these all these sources have informed how my imagination was structured so being a person who wants to learn more about who i actually am in christ um puts me in a place where i'm a student mm-hmm. um where i'm a where i'm a learner and so when i'm in conversation say like with black women uh, or with any uh, any non-white person, as they think about being Christian, makes those conversations revelatory for me. I'm not the patron. Mm. I'm not the teacher. Mm. I'm not the one who has it all figured mm. out. And if if the process of discipleship and you know, relational discipleship and corporate discipleship is the process of all all of us moving toward Christ as our teacher, then I am not a teacher. I am a student, and I'm a fellow student. Mm. Mm-hmm. So all of my language has to has to reflect that um, the way that I see brothers and sisters has to reflect that and not not has to it gets to like like that's part of the wonderful process of of me being blessed by others. So I, I try to use I try to express my project and my pursuit as often as possible in ways that reflect that like I'm not doing this to be a good patron. I'm a client and a fellow client you know, of others, um, you know, and our patron is God, our father, and he's the only patron. There's not like a a bunch of other sources of blessing. Yeah. As I've listened to you talk on this subject before, I do think you come across, uh, unusually, I think as both convicted and curious, uh, and, and that's a delicate balance. I think. How's that? What do you, how would you explain that? You come across as like, Hey, the Bible needs to inform the way we're seeing things. There's a conviction there that, hey, we have sin, we need to own it. Um, not every, not everything is bad, but there's so you're, you go, you know, there's conviction for truth and doing it right, but there's a curiosity that says, you know what, I have not figured that out and we need to learn we need to listen. We need to be in constant dialogue so we can figure out what this means. And so, sure. so, but what I find in a lot of the ongoing dialogue is people are convicted and passionate. They have all the answers, but then the curiosity goes out the door. And then everyone else is like, you know, yeah. what do we know? And, you know, whatever they say, it, it kind of gets wishy-washy. And <laughs> so, yeah, you know, anyways, those are the extremes. But I, I really appreciate you navigating that that middle path. Yeah, well, to me, this is what's exciting about uh, so many aspects of being Christian is not that... Um, I get to master a bunch of stuff and then have all the answers and tell everybody what the answers are. But I, you know, to be a disciple, as you know, is to be a learner. And, um, I don't, 
it seems to me that people want to graduate from that status at some point and be the ones with all the answers. And there's just so much of God's big world to understand and to know and to be blessed by and to enjoy. And um, that kind of posture uh, of always learning and always coming to better understanding puts me in a place where I am always being given gifts by my brothers and sisters. Mm -hmm. Um, And I'm always being blessed and I'm always being loved. So for me, it comes down to fundamental Christian identity. I'm, I'm a person loved by God. I'm a person uh, justified. There's no condemnation. So when we talk about race and gender and a lot of other uh, social dynamics, we can't be talking about, you know, you know, where to blame or we should be ashamed or you're to blame or you should be ashamed because we're people loved by God and already set right. And now we're people unleashed to discover just what that means. And it's all good. It's wonderful. And so that can be a hopeful process of discovery and um, living into the great wide expanse of liberation. And that requires curiosity and it requires friends and partners. And to me, it's like if all my friends and partners in that process are other white men that have seen the world the way that I've always seen it for years, then I'm not going to get to discover the great expanses that are there in this place called liberation. And there, there's some other corners of it. There's some other pastures. There's a a mountain view over there. I didn't know about, but there's other people that are curious about that. And so they'll be able to take you there. Yeah. So it seems to me that we have to have as wide a range of conversation partners as possible. Yeah. Well, I love to invite our listeners to this kind of pathway of curiosity. And I think one of them is through the topic of white theology, which is why I initially contacted you. I heard you start kind of not framing the contours of what white theology is and is not. And I said, okay, let's, let's kind of process this together and hopefully this can start a conversation. So uh, before we talk about white theology, we got to talk about what is whiteness. And so people are going to hear different things when we say white theology what is whiteness as you, as you've used it when you talk about whiteness and white theology? Yeah. So whiteness is not existence as a white person. Uh, whiteness is not, you know, being white. Um, and, and whiteness is not even like sort of like what white people like or don't like or whatever. Um, whiteness is sort of an, it's a ideological lens that came that, uh, The whole world has inherited. It has sort of uh, come over the entire, uh, over the whole globe. I mean, it's really affected um, every nation on earth. But when when Europeans started colonizing other parts of the world in the 13th and 14th centuries, um, they came into contact with other people, people with darker skin, other kinds of features and different social patterns and all the rest. And European uh, colonizers uh, began ranking uh, people in value according to the color of their skin. And, I mean, uh, Willie Jennings in his book, uh, The Christian Imagination, has that chart reproduced. So this was very um, explicitly laid out. And uh, so this is, we're well over 500 years into that way of thinking being sort of um, unleashed on the world. And so it's an ideology. It's sort of a way of thinking about uh, how people have value according to the color of their skin. And then, you know, there's cultural aspects of that. It's an ideology. It's an ideological lens. And it's a it's an entire set of social patterns and um, ideological assumptions um, that, you know, like what's white is better or has more value um, and all the way to blackness. Like what is black has less value, is less desirable and um, so, of course, contribute less. So, what you're saying then yeah. is that uh, what you're implying is that a non-white person could affirm whiteness or hold to sure. whiteness and hold to white theology, even if they're not white, you know, skin color wise. Yes, everybody's been affected by it. It affects everybody. These ways of thinking, and um, yeah, absolutely, it's come over the entire. And uh, Willie Jen, again, I'm referencing him in his most recent book. He writes about this um, that. Uh, desire has been sort of provoked on the part of everybody toward whiteness. Like whiteness is centered. If you think about you know concentric rings, whiteness is at the center, and and maleness is at the center, according to this whole ideological frame. And every you know people of color, black, brown people, are distanced from the center, and they're 
pitched toward the center. They want to get to the center. And so they, it benefits them, or I should say it this way, in order to survive, um, you kind of sort of have to buy the ideology of whiteness or you have to play by its rules. And that's just, it's just the rules of the game. And what's really insidious about it is that people of color get it. They see it. They understand it. They know it. But white people are blind to it. We, we just have never been taught to see it. In fact, the way that we have been uh, initiated in our education and all of our assumptions, we've been trained to just not see it. So we see, we, we talk about churches and black churches, mm. or we talk about uh, there's, there's a school and there's a black school, mm. or there's that neighbor, the neighborhood over there, and then that black neighborhood. Or like, like, think about what I would think about your own thoughts right now as I tell you this little story. I um been really influenced by my pastor and um a bunch of resources my pastor has given to me and uh the things that we've been reading together and having discussions and um my pastor has just had a massive influence on so many ways that I think about being Christian. So, the three of you just stop for a second and at what have you pictured when I talk about my pastor? <laughs> did you did you th- did you think of a black woman? Mm-hmm. Did yeah. you think of an Asian woman? Yeah. No, I just went with the standard. Did the stand- you think of a black man? I went to the standard assumption that people go to churches that look with people that look like them, and therefore mm-hmm. it's probably a white man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is so. It's like, yeah. um, but I think it's it's like if I was talking about this this speaker or this pastor, yeah. and it was a white man, I I don't have to label him. But if it's a black man or an Asian man or a woman, you, they, they get a label. So it's like uh, whiteness and maleness is the unmarked assumed set. That's that's the norm. Mm-hmm. So like when I would go into my classroom to teach my classes, I, I could go in and feel completely at home there. It, it was space that I belonged in. I it was the assumption was I, it was normal that I was there. But for um, my black female colleague, um, she was always always having the feeling and it was reinforced that she had to justify and explain her place in that classroom mm-hmm. yeah. and uh, <laughs> for a black male colleague or for a, even a, a white woman. So whiteness does that. It's yeah. not, there's no white person that ever like, you know, none of us have signed up to that. Yeah. None of us have agreed to it. Uh, we're not necessarily to blame for it, but we're responsible to my mm-hmm. mind to see it and to do the work of understanding its dimensions and it's how does it how does it talk how does whiteness train us to talk and how does discipleship to Jesus train us yeah. to talk how does how does whiteness teach me to see the world and how does discipleship to Jesus teach me to see the world so yeah. i mean one of my biggest questions is when i look at an an asian student an asian colleague a black colleague a black student um a male a female I'm always asking myself, what are the, do I, do I see each and every one of these as image of God, mm-hmm. as, as an image bearer that can equally bless me? Um, and if not, why not? Or even, even people who are uh, disabled or have people with disabilities. I'm, I just, I know, I mean, I've done the work and I'm only starting to do the work, but I, I see how my imagination was shaped for me to see people and assign them value. Yeah. And, um, that's, you know, that's as I looked at literature, people talking about white theology and whiteness's influence on the church, there seems to be kind of some blurred categories uh, where people use whiteness with Eurocentric, you know, European. Um, but then, you know, European theology was preceded, you know, any kind of labeling and category of whiteness. And other people say, I don't like the, the word itself because it seems to really lump in race as and reinforce that so might white whiteness here in this conversation be a specific contextual way of actually talking about what maybe majoritarianism or you know so like if what we're talking about when we say whiteness i think about my time in in china the han people are like 90 something percent of the overall population if we were all in china now might we be saying hanness and and yet all the same dynamics by you know by and large that are problematic with whiteness could be said with hanness or you could pick your different majority group people it is what we're talking about when we're saying whiteness 
just a contextually specific term for a, a phenomenon that happens all over the world, but not necessarily concerning white people? It might be. I think race certainly is one of, it's a set of lines or it, it's a line of difference uh, across which there's been oppression and injustice, exclusion, marginalization, domination, murder, rape, theft. I mean, it's like, uh, that's a line of difference across which there's been done all this stuff. There are other lines like gender. There are other lines uh, like the um, Jewish, non-Jewish line is, is another one. Um, I think I want to be very cautious about that kind of intellectual move and just put it under suspicion and put put the crosshairs on and ask where you're going for this reason. That is one way that that's, that's one way that I think white people have felt like this discussion of race um, makes me feel a little bit uncomfortable. I'd like to retreat and use generalized terms. And what, and when that, when we do Mm. that, um, Mm. we are able to make fuzzy and, obscure a number of injustices that have been done and in to my mind and i don't know i'm not saying that's what you're doing jackson but what I, what's really dangerous yeah is that the um the literature produced by white people to justify um anti-black exclusion you know jim crow laws slavery counting people as non-citizens etc was so specifically white and black so it's like an injustice has been done in exactly those terms. Yeah. And then also um, one of the wonderful ways that redemption is depicted for, for many black Americans and, and black people in other parts of the world is to own and uh, learn to love blackness and their own black selves and black music and black culture um, as mm-hmm. something that is mm-hmm. absolutely uh, worthy of um, you know human admiration and human celebration because they're image bearers and communities are, are, are image bearers. So I just want to be, yeah. I, I just know that in talking about race, it's been very satisfying when I've spoken with um, black people that the language is so specific. They identify as black. So we should yeah. use that language. Yeah. But I don't know if that's yeah. where you're going necessarily. Yeah. And so, the, well, well, I was thinking in terms of what are, for two things. One, if we want to think about whiteness in the West and its manifestations. One of the things that we can look to to learn lessons and see things from different perspectives so that we can glean from is, for example, the injustices that have happened in you know, Cambodia and Myanmar and in China historically, these majority peoples who very much dominated, mistreated minority peoples and so forth and so on. Yeah. A lot of the very similar dynamics, rape, theft, so forth and so on, uh, that two things, one, Sometimes it helps to solve one problem. You go, okay, what's going on there? Then you turn the lens back on. You go, oh, so so cross cultural learning. And then two, you know, what might we learn as we go, you know, from whiteness and racism here, and then go, okay, now that now as people who are crossing cultures, they can be more aware and sensitive to the dynamics that are happening there because they're aware. So that's (laughs) what I'm. That's what I'm exploring is whether or not whiteness is a contextually specific manifestation of this power dynamic that manifests in different contexts. uh, It's funny because I remember, funny, it's horrible. I remember reading, um, you know, learning about the caste system in India and then just thinking, wow, that's so crazy. We don't have anything like that here. And that's, that's one of the illusions that whiteness affords or one of the ways that it blinds is that we Mm. have had exactly the same thing here. And um, Isabel, Isabel uh, Wilkerson just, uh, yeah, she just wrote that book, Cast. Wilkerson, yeah. And um, it's like, that's that's a great yeah. frame. That's a good analog to uh, what has happened in America over the last um, 402 years, 403 years. And it's, um, so yeah, there are yeah. situations like that. I think if they're worth exploring. I think that uh, what, I'd, what I would want to do as a, a white person what I'd want to be very careful of is is um, to assume the task of finding those analogies. I think that black thinkers have to do that um, because what mm. inevitably I will yeah. I will you know always fall into that trap of thinking that I'm a, a white savior and and I'm here to help. I'm here to I'm here to be a, an ally, 
and I will give myself the benefit of the doubt and give my people the benefit yeah. of the doubt or give the culture that I inherited the benefit of the doubt. That's one of the things we have to learn, I think, is who my people are is the church and, and all other all other humans. But um, mm-hmm. so yeah, I think we have to be just very careful with those mm-hmm. analogs, yeah. but they inevitably they can be helpful. Like in South Africa would be a great, a great one of these. Yeah. And highlight something that we're not doing, which is the Truth and Reconciliation uh, Committee, which is committed to exposing everything so that they could all experience healing. And we're committed to a national project of obscuring and hiding. Um, and we're passing laws now mm-hmm. to make sure that in our schools, it's never talked about, which is an absolute shame. And that, I don't know how yeah. any person who's Christian can can think like that and talk like that. Um, who is committed to the Christian practice of confession of sin and repentance. You, you know, you, you don't hide your sins yeah. you confess yeah. and you shed light so that you can experience wholeness and healing. Yeah. yeah. And that's a really good, I, I appreciate you bringing that up, Tim, because uh, this issue of whiteness in our own country seems to be something that is, you know, increasingly real and divisive and needs to be explored and, you know, with humility, and we need to do a lot of listening. And other countries have done a good job dealing with, you know, profound traumas and holocausts. You know, Germany has done a really good job uh, dealing with their horrors from World War II and, and acknowledging what these things are and bringing to the surface and really doing hard work about that. You mentioned uh, South South Africa and their Truth and Reconciliation Conference. And here, we want to shut down the conversation in many parts of the society. And so, you know, while we recognize that this is a difficult subject, it is a really important conversation yeah, it's crucial to my for mind. us to have. Um, again, going back to scripture, I think about yeah. this all the time. I was thinking about this this morning to think about Paul's exhortation in Colossians to put on uh a heart of compassion is the kind of the tidy way of saying it. But uh, because that's not heart there in Greek, it's splankna, it's bowels. Um, he's telling the Colossians to like wh- where your feelings are, like cultivate the feelings of compassion, like, like do the work to develop the feelings of how it feels for people in other social situations. So it's like, what, what has life been like here? in America for enslaved Africans over the last 403 years to, in obedience to the Lord Jesus Christ, we respond to that by doing our homework, by learning, by listening to stories and by, um, by reading the history, the unvarnished truth to get at it. So yet it's more recently as race discussions are, are becoming, um, I guess I'd want to reframe that. It's not that they've been divisive, I think that race discussions have been coming to the fore more recently and have been uncomfortable. They've provoked a lot of defensiveness and anger in many white people. They race has been a divisive issue uh, for 403 years. I mean, that's it's like that's the issue. And yeah. it's like white people have denied knowing about it. And you know, what have we done? What I mean, think about I'm sure all you you three have worked in some kind of um, pastoral role of counseling, you know, and, and, and that sort of thing. Think about how unhealthy a person is who has experienced trauma, say, 15, 20 years ago, and just does not ever talk about it and doesn't want to talk about it. And if you want to talk about it, they'll fight you off. It's like you end up being so unhealthy right. in so many ways. And we as a nation have chosen ill health for ourselves, it's not like we're preventing other people from healing. We are, but uh, we're hurting ourselves by not letting the light shine and experiencing God's redemption. Unfortunate. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, yeah, absolutely. It is unfortunate, and most of the time, I would think the white community, at least in America, is it's just out of fear and out of scarcity, right? That more yeah, power for others threatened. means less power for them, you know? Um, yeah. And I was having a conversation yesterday with a group of women and they were saying, you know, I think America is at a place where we're ready to bring missionaries from, you know, whether it be Africa, China, South Korea. And I remember thinking at the time, while I, I would agree with that 
statement that we could use some missionaries here as well is that I remember thinking, I wonder how open the white community would be to <clears throat> sitting down with the Kenyan missionary and hearing what they have to say, leaning into what they're saying. I, you touched on this, Tim, a second ago. There's a presumption when we go, when I went to China, there was a presumption that there'll be some bumpy cultural things, but mm -hmm. they're going to want to hear what I have to say. And when I flip it, I think, I wonder if, it, you know, a, a minority group um, missionary came over and, and sat with a, a, a white community, how open they would be to he, receiving their message, or if they would really see mm -hmm. it as this foreign expression and maybe not be as open, which maybe leads us into yeah. the discussion about white theology. You know, what it is, what are some kind of bullet yeah, points? Yeah, first of all, and, I would want to name more exactly what you're describing is that presumption uh that we're the we're the ones who have the answers we're yeah, the ones who yeah. know and it's it's our task to be you know the dispensers of all of this wisdom and you are the ones who don't know we you know we're the we're the teachers of the world right right the teachers for the rest of um whatever it's really it's it's a the presumption and yeah. arrogance is really powerful so that would be one um Absolutely. one feature of it and i'm sure that others could describe this more fully um but i it, it seems to me that whiteness um so that that kind of presumption does not see itself in conversation with others so like i i mentioned that that image that mm -hmm. willie jennings has he contrasts that image with the seminary classroom the way that you know, we have historically done seminary education is there's you know there's a professor up front and everybody else is you know, looking at the professor and attending to the professor, and it's typically the professor, the assumption is it's a white male. And everybody is in the posture and position of desiring what the white male has and who the white male is. And he, and he suggests an alternative uh, model mm. and an alternative image, and that is people gathered around Jesus, which is, I, I think, just a wonderful model. Well, that whiteness is threatened by that because well, first of all, white theology does not want to say white theology. It's just theology. Just like there's a there's there's a church and there's a black church. Right. right. Um, we, we, one of the features is it's nameless. So there's theology and then there's black theology. And uh, what is it's obscured to right. us that our that white theology is a kind of theological thinking. And we don't we don't even we and even the first time i heard that and it took me a while to kind of get my head around this i was like i, I get that you're saying something but i there's no I, can't, I don't see it you'll have to prove that to me and it's one of those so one of the mm. features of white theology doesn't want to it doesn't want to accept its name and then it doesn't want to see itself in conversation with others like it's not a way of doing theology that is shoulder to shoulder with others in conversation being blessed and blessing being given gifts and giving gifts. It's not in that kind of relationship of mutuality. It's the boss. It's the one. It's, um, you know, white theology wants to be doing what the disciples around Jesus were doing, and that is excluding all the other people. So, so do you, right. So do you think, do you think the construction of whiteness, it's like four or 500 years ago, uh, however you date it, has made the, ideal if you want to call it of colorblindness impossible from here on I mean, oh yeah because we you know there's people say hey why, why can't we be colorblind but colorblindness can is used as a kind of power thing trip to just yeah. let's just ignore yeah. all that just wipe all that under the rug right so has the existence the emergence of this category good whiteness made that a, an illegitimate goal or how yeah, do you i think it should it? yeah i think it absolutely should I mean, keep in mind that um that our theological heritage from Europe uh, was developed in tandem with the colonial project. So the colonial project of coming to lands in South America and Africa and Asia um, to steal their stuff and um, you know to increase European wealth, that that was developed in tandem with um, you know a mission project. So there were theologians and pastors and teachers going over to christianize these places and so theology was developed uh within 
the colonial project within this larger sort of capitalist logic and a logic of accumulation mm-hmm. and theft. And so it is a kind of theology developed to be able to be comfortable with uh, intentional and devastating injustice. So, um, yeah, it, and, and also um, colorblindness is really, is nothing at all of a good goal. Uh, colorblindness is a, is a good way of saying I when I meet other humans, I don't want to know their stories. I don't want to know where mm. they come from. I don't want to know their identity. Mm. I don't want to know their loves and hopes and fears and dreams and tragedies. Yeah. Uh, I want to be able to treat them how I want to, without any regard for who they are. I mean, it's it's so ungodly. And again, this is what this is how whiteness tells itself that that it is being fair. We're not going to look at color. That's another way of saying I'm not going to treat people with the dignity, the specific dignity that they deserve. And I'm not going to overcome my own barriers to treating them well. But other features of white theology would be uh, doing theology for the individual, thinking about mm. thinking about um, yeah the way that individualism has shaped a theological vision. So when I think about uh, sanctification. I'm always talking about the Christian. I'm doing a big project on Romans now, just reading through commentaries and looking at how commentators talk about the individual Christian or justification and the Christian or sanctification and the Christian. It's always individualistic because that's our frame of reference. When we think about soteriology, we talk about the benefits received uh, by God or from God by the individual. So individualism, when we think about the Christian life, um, most much of our talk when we think about being Christian is I and me. Uh, we don't do well with we and the church. So individualism. Also, um, interiority. That is, um, when I think about being Christian, I'm talking mainly about my heart, Jesus in my heart. Um, I mean, how many evangelical, how many generations of evangelical people have grown up asking Jesus into their heart? And it's like, he's in there. And that's the the process of being a good evangelical is to make sure he doesn't get out or make sure he just doesn't affect the rest of my body. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it's like, he's in my heart. I have an eternity in heaven. And this is all based on a declaration that happened in heaven for my justification. So notice how everything is abstracted and interior. It's about the future. It's about what's in heaven. And it's about what's in my heart. But don't talk about my body. We don't talk about the bodies that I'm connected to in a corporate body. And we don't talk about the social practices that we all cultivate as we go out into um, our our, uh, local situations and bless other bodies and find out how our body is being affected by what's happening in our our local communities. So interiority, um, heavenly, you know, everything's heavenly, everything's abstract. It's embodied. Um, disembodied in so many ways and so uh we talk about a system of theology that people need to know they know it instead of uh, a lived reality in fact this is one of the big struggles that many pastors and missionaries face when they leave seminary how does any of this apply like we you have to do the work of application like how in the world does this abstracted body of knowledge have any relevance in my world Whereas, you know, in the New Testament, the only thing that the New Testament writers are talking about is something that is absolutely, utterly relevant right now, today, in their world. Um, But we've managed to read it in an abstract way that just has to do with kind of heavenly realities and internal realities. Uh, All of that, I think this is from my discussion with Preston that you had heard, Jackson, when you got in touch, that all of this was this kind of theological way of thinking was all developed and then really propagated in America over the last 400 years by, um, you know, by white men. And that's, I'm not blaming white men or saying that they're bad, but white men and uh, white within white cultural settings that did theology in such a way that they were comfortable living with the injustices uh, perpetrated by, you know, by white Christians uh, against black people specifically. So all the stuff about love of neighbor um, and the specific ways that that would be worked out, all the ways that, you know, churches in the New Testament 
are depicted as crossing uh, social boundaries and varieties of ethnic, uh, ethnicities gathered together. All of that has to be obscured and not talked about. I mean, when mm-hmm. I when I uh, went into my uh, THM, I started seeing all this stuff that I was not taught and started kind of yeah. talking about it and writing about it in papers. And what do you think happened in my conservative <laughs> evangelical seminary? You know, I'm accused <laughs> of being a liberal um, by just writing about what I'm seeing Paul talk about. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. would you say that white theology, if you can identify this thing with this group of whatever thoughts, <laughs> impressions, whatever as white theology, it's not so much explicit doctrines, but emphases um, or imbalanced emphases, selective emphases. Uh, like, like, for example, I was reading an article talking about why theology tends to select, be selectively literal. So with creationism and historically slavery, uh, they're literal. But with j- the year of Jubilee and women's clothing, we're not so literal. And yeah. so would you say white theology is more about the things we emphasize and minimize than doctrinal statements or, or what, how would you, yeah. how would you sort that out? Well, like I said, I'm a beginner and still identifying all of this. Um, but yeah, selective literalism, um, to me, to me, it's a, it's, um, got a number of facets and features that operate at different levels. They're not just like bullet points. And I think it's, it's really for other people beyond, beside white people to identify all this because they would see it clearly, but it seems to me it, it's a framework. It's a set of language. Uh, it's a way. It's a way of seeing, but I do think that individualism, interiority, abstract theology, um, are at the heart of it. And yeah, selective literalism for sure. I mean, thinking about and talking. Or um, I'll tell you another way that it was that it was affected. That I was affected. You may have been touched by this tradition in one way or another, but I was raised and then trained in a, in a uh, dispensationalist tradition and, and way of reading. And um, in that mode of theology, there was um, dispensationalists and, and really a lot of a lot of Western Christians really struggled to know what to do with Jesus and the Gospels. And there is a massive priority on Paul um, in our churches and in, in, um, in certainly dispensationalism and certainly in Reformed, the varieties of Reformed traditions in America. Because Paul is one of the New Testament writers that can be turned into an, a theologian very concerned about the abstract. Now, that's a, I mean, we were, you know, being familiar with the new perspective, Jackson, you know, you've done work on this. But it's like, that's a, that's a corruption of Paul. He's very concerned about uh, the situations that his communities face and how they can live out the kingdom of God vision that Jesus talks about in the Gospels. But in my heritage, and I think this is one of the features of whiteness, Jesus's vision of the kingdom of God and the intentional, persistent justice doing that the kingdom of God calls us to, not because it's difficult or like strenuous, but because it's, it's, it's the way of life and it doesn't look very hopeful or promising, but it's actually the way of liberation. But the social practices that Jesus talks about in the gospels are really challenging. And so for my dispensational heritage, Jesus' teachings and the Gospels were for the first century when the kingdom might have happened, and because the kingdom did not arrive, the kingdom of God is purely a future reality, and the, the, the teachings of Jesus in the Gospels only refers to the future when the kingdom age is here. Nowadays, you don't have to worry about that. Don't talk about discipleship. Mm-hmm. Don't talk about Jesus and the teaching of the kingdom of God. Um, that that just completely reinforces whiteness because you can you can blithely participate in all the um, social injustices that are perpetrated in our culture without thinking that you have to purposely sort of live countercultural to them. So I, I think that that's another facet of whiteness is really dispensationalism is sort of like the perfect example of it. Well, so that being a believer is really about beliefs as opposed yep. to any sort of behavior, you know, one of the things I think you either said on Preston's podcast or in Voxology, I can't remember, but you talked about examining faith statements between like wh- a lot of white church institutions compared to like churches and seminaries of people of color. I took you up on that challenge and I, and I just dived into 
trying to find face statements of that's interesting what, what did you churches. find or what, what's some what's some of your findings? oh my it was it was breathtaking because it was exhausting trying to actually find the kind of statements of faith that you find in white organizations mm-hmm. they just they just flat weren't there mm-hmm. and what you did find were i found a few traits if you found anything, it was usually like the Apostles' Creed or something like that, sure. if you found anything. But otherwise, you found a lot of, almost always, the story of our church, your local mm. church, the personal story of our pastor. Wow. It was extremely intimate, extremely concrete, uh, and a lot of, this is what we're about in the world, whether it be mm-hmm. feeding the poor, justice issues, wherever it may be. I mean, that was all over the place. It was extremely difficult to find anything remotely resembling a quote unquote standard statement of faith that you'd find at, say, the Gospel Coalition or some other church, whatever. And and that right there is a really concrete, in your face, you know, contrast and perspectives about uh, theology, theology, white theology versus other kind of theology. Hey guys, I am the theologian in residence at a fantastic organization called Mission One who sponsors this podcast. We partner with the global church in making communities more like the kingdom of God. Mission One partners with locally led ministries and denominations on projects, training, and relief efforts in their own communities. From clean water and education, to church planning and discipleship, to theological training and contextualization. Mission One desires to see every community transformed for the glory of God and the honor of all peoples. If you want to learn more about our work at Mission One, visit us at missionone.org. Yeah, we were talking about, Preston and I were talking about the struggle that we had at a conservative evangelical school to hire a person of color and on a theology faculty. And, um, what I thought was interesting was the way that we always explained it to ourselves. Uh, you know, no person of color applied, blah, 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 a lot of other reasons why we were a very homogenous faculty. Um, but it, it struck me that our doctrinal statement at that school had, I think, maybe two significant points out of like 14 or 15, but two of them were on like specific parsing about what happened when in the end time scenario. Um, again, Mark Knowles said this about. I think you said this about evangelicals. Evangelicals are very concerned about fighting for the earth's first days and the earth's last <laughs> days and not very concerned about the present days of the earth. And so, yeah, we had statements mm-hmm. in our doctrinal statement about, I mean, extensive on creation, literal six day creation, and then extensive on the last days. And uh, what else was in there? Um, very carefully crafted stuff about inerrancy. And yeah, so when you find, um, you know, uh, in black denominations like Kojic, um, in in black churches like say Progressive Baptist Church in Chicago, there's a, there's a we've got some local friends here in uh, in Grand Rapids. There is um, the main points are Christian orthodoxy, and yeah. um, many many white denominational schools and um, many white Christian organizations in America are formed out of fights and splits and out of an intentional um, defining ourselves, not by that group. And so we find ourselves moving farther and farther away from just being connected to the historic church and historic orthodoxy. We have to figure, you know, find ways to be unique. And that comes in the precise way we parse the abstract theology. Okay, so here is a... I, what I hope is maybe a constructive idea. I think white theology, a white ecclesiology tends to be bounded set. That is, for people who don't know that, like, there's a boundary and you have to believe this or do this in order to be inside. Whereas another way of considering the church, and I want to hear what you think about this, might this be a way out of, uh, a way out of white theology and all its bad manifestations? That is maybe more of a centered set ecclesiology to where it's oriented on Christ as opposed to these boundary lines. And so you don't necessarily have a really clear line. That, uh, that Might that be a constructive, more constructive approach to kind of break out of some of these white, theo- white theology categories? Or I'm just brainstorming. I'm talking off the cuff here. Um, 
Yeah, I, I, I'm not sure. I, I'm not sure. I, I wonder what, um, it seems to me that a, a better way out of these, the sort of the cul-de-sac that we've gotten ourselves into is to just start uh, conversations um, with uh, black church thinkers, black church leaders, Asian church leaders and thinkers, church leaders from other parts of the world that that see us for who we are. We don't see, I mean, nobody can sort of see themselves. It, it takes conversation with others. And I think it, um, if we just got into greater conversation and recognized yeah. the factors that keep us from conversation and keep us from fruitful conversation, um, I think I think that ways forward forward would begin to emerge. Um, but we're yeah. not going to find answers until we sort of recognize how power yeah. holds us in our churches and institutions and organizations yeah. and, you know, resources and money. I mean, a lot of, there's a lot at stake. <clears throat> there's a lot well, that we here's, are, here's are, are going to give up. Here's what I had yeah. in mind when I said that, because we can get in conversation, but if we maintain this idea that the other side has to check off these boxes, that is to be inside the box, to be inside the boundaries, yeah, then it's just going to perpetuate problems. But if we can, you, you talk about the church is my people, as opposed to, you know, this cultural group, this cultural tribe. And I'm wondering if some of our bounded setness emphasis so much on that really enable it, caused us to trap our cultural situatedness in a confusion with Jesus, yeah. you know, who's at the center. I don't know. That's just, yeah. I'm just thinking uh bounded set and uh, centered set. It, it just, it seems to me that that limits my options. Mm -hmm. And, and yeah. what opens up my options is understanding, all right, who we are, we're siblings, we are um, partners, co-laborers, et cetera. So what does it look like for us when we look at when, when my church looks at that black church across town, do we think we are in the bounded set with them? Mm -hmm. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? Like that's yeah. us, those people, that's mm -hmm. us and we are them. And there's a, it's a problem that we don't know their lives. And it's a problem. They, they, you know, they don't know our lives, our names, our stories. And so we need to start um, identifying with one another and finding ways forward for our communities that are now separated by walls how do we be, how do we recognize we're in the same family? Why do, why don't we ever have family meals? There's, that's a problem. Yeah. Um, yeah. Then we can find out who we are and like what factors have come into play historically to prevent us from, from knowing our siblings and cousins as intensely as we might. What are those factors? Cause they're not yeah. loyalty to Jesus factors. Yeah. Yeah. I think kind of Tim, what I'm hearing you say too, is that, so much of this goes back to realizing that uh, other countries, other people, other genders, other ethnicities have different questions that they're asking of scripture and of culture. And so we can assume, uh, you know, maybe under the umbrella of white theology, these are the questions that we would bring to the text. Mm. But if we're not asking our Chinese neighbors, what are, what are the questions that you would bring to this? Um, mm. then I think that's where we're missing because missing one another is, is what I'm hearing you saying is we've got to be listening to the questions they're asking as well, especially when you get to hermeneutics, right? Yeah. This, this whole thing is hermeneutics, right? Recognizing, mm. recognizing the features of culture and social practices and ideologies and lenses that keep us from listening to the text well and wisely and fruitfully and so, yeah, having conversation with with uh, Christians from other cultures, and really just people, um, are going to help us to see what um, what what are the questions that we bring to the text. Like we think, uh, you wrote this in your email to me, Jackson. We think that we're being objective because we just do theology, black right. theology. They're not being objective. <laughs> they're coming from an angle. That's like that mm. is baloney. We come, from, <laughs> right. we come from an angle and because, yeah. and we are among, so among the communities of Christians from around the world, we are the most blind because we mm -hmm. think that we're yeah. the only ones who see. And Jesus has something to say that about that at the end of John nine. Um, so we're, we think that we're the teachers and that we're the only ones with sight. So we're obviously blinded to reality. And the question is, what are our questions? Like for, for yeah. example, um, my, my 
uh, career, I was, I'm a student of Paul the Apostle, who for uh, much of his ministry, for, for a bunch of different times, he, he knows life as an incarcerated person, okay? He knows life as an incarcerated person because that's how he identifies himself, and he was incarcerated. Um, what I think is helpful for me is to say, is to not call Paul a prisoner because that is so familiar, it's very safe, but to call Paul mm. a felon or he's an incarcerated person. Mm. Um, and so I know, I know life as a person of great power and privilege. And I'm very comfortable and I don't um, sleep out exposed to the elements except when we go camping. I know life as a person of comfort and a person of social power. And so as a, as a person that claims to be a student of this person who knew life as an incarcerated person, I'm going to become a better student if I know incarcerated people well. And incarcerated mm -hmm. people are going to be the people that are better placed to get somebody writing from that perspective better than me. So mm. I have a hermeneutical challenge and I come from an angle and I can get to know people who are already, you know, who come from a, a different angle. And when I get to know them better, I'm better placed to get that kind of an author. And I claim to follow a person who uh, was a homeless man. I've never been homeless. I've always been very comfortable and so I don't know life, a life of homelessness and need. And so again, hermeneutically, I've got some pretty massive challenges where people um, who are homeless and people who live on the edge of, you know, in desperation, they are better situated to get the words and teachings of Jesus than, than I am. Um, yeah, also, you're, you're talking, a, go ahead. Well, well the, here's the other thing, the audiences for Jesus's teachings are are all living in empire. They're occupied territories. So like I, yeah. you know, who are, who are the people that are going to get that well? Well, native people to this land and black people and other people who are living in marginalized situations, but the people who are the people in power will, will have the greatest hermeneutical challenge. So mm. just all that is to say, I come from an angle and it's 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 sort of a lie we tell ourselves that we're the objective ones, and so therefore we're the mm -hmm. teachers of the rest of the world. Yeah, you're yeah. talking about what I mean. I've spent ten the last ten fifteen years trying to get across this idea of contextualization. Sure, that's what you're talking about, and it begins with interpretation. Mm -hmm. And what I can imagine people hearing you say, because they hear that's what they think I'm saying, is that does this lead to relativism, and that there's you're saying there's white theology and it's good. That's for white people. And there's black theology. It's good for black people. And everybody has their own theology. Good for them. That's not exactly what you're saying. Am no. I right? No, not at all. Um, no, I, what I'm, what I'm saying is um, we, we have fallen into a situation where we do theology uh, in order to benefit ourselves and in order to sort of keep ourselves blind from who we really are. And what we should recognize and be, be honest about what we're doing, become more skillful in being faithful disciples of Jesus, which is not going to lead us to relativism, but will will lead us to relatives that we have in the family of God that we've managed <laughs> to just avoid. <laughs> yeah. Right, right. Yeah, I frequently say we all have a relative perspective on absolute truth. And, you know, and that and our situatedness, our whiteness, our blackness, or whatever gives us a relative perspective or can give us relative perspective. Sure. Yeah. It can blind us or can help so, us to see. Um, yeah. Guys, we, uh, we are running low on time. Do you, do you have any uh, questions before we ask our final question or two or our closing questions? Werner, well, I mean, I've got like six pages of questions, but I'm not <laughs> sure we have time for that. So you're going to have to come back. Hey, I'd love it. Anytime. Time when you're cleaning. Sure. I have one question. Okay. Yeah, my my one question, Tim, has to do with how whiteness gives us. You mentioned soteriology, or you know, we avoid things in the middle between creation and the last days. Um, what does uh, a white biased view of theology? How does that affect our view of sin? Hmm. Yeah, that's a good. That's a great question. Uh, it seems to me that. We've, we've managed to see sin in very individualistic terms. So sin is something that I'm born with, and sin uh, is sort of the category for things that, that I do 
that um, harm others and that um, put me at um, at odds with God, obviously. And then I that's that's something that I have to take care of when it comes to my relationship with God in Christ. And um, but I think the focus is on sins that sins that sort of describe the actions that I carry out. And um, in Paul, it, well, I'll just say starting with Genesis four, uh, when God talks to Cain about sin, sin is is an active force in the world, and it's something that entered and that has has aims and strategies. Um, and Paul talks about sin in Romans five through eight, and also in Galatians, he he personifies sin. So sin uh, seizes initiative, sin enters, sin has dominion. So sin is this cosmic force, this personified cosmic force that has aims and intentions and plans to prevent humanity from experiencing God's flourishing and God's order of shalom. Um, and sin is also the things that I do for sure. But I think that whiteness has prevented us from seeing the larger kind of cosmic entity that sin is. Yeah, we, we don't do well. We, we actually avoid talking about structural and systemic realities and how the cosmic power of sin has oriented cultural values and cultural patterns and systems and structures to bring about oppression, exploitation of the weak and vulnerable. And um, the prophets talk about that. Paul talks about that when he talks about the powers and authorities. And um, I think that's, I think that's what we miss, which is unfortunate. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I just did a quick Amazon search out of curiosity on white theology just to see what popped up. And something on dispensationalism popped oh, up. Oh, really? And and Norm Geisler's systematic theology ah, popped up. Shocker. It's yeah, he's a it's great, actually a, a he was a he'd be great science instance and, of a white theologian. Actually. Science and the there's a science and theology book that popped up, the science issues. It's like scary yeah. actually <laughs> how much <laughs> yeah there are, there are a number of people well i'll just say there are a number of theologians that i've known in my journey that um embody this that um and this is a problem i think that there are a yeah. number of people who actually can be really um really awful human beings and yet be regarded as a reputable theologian because whiteness yeah. doesn't whiteness is um enables us to tolerate injustice and tolerate a lack of personal growth and discipleship to Jesus while also yeah. being regarded as somebody who's really important, which is, it's really a tragedy. Yeah. It's focusing on those key, key doctrinal statements and foregoing all of the fruit of the yeah. spirit. In fact, <laughs> fighting and destroying each other and bearing the fruit of the works of doing the works of the flesh in the name of theology. I mean, it's just crazy. You right. see it a lot. I mean, just get on yeah. Twitter. Yeah. In the name of theology. In the name yeah. of yeah, when I read when I read uh, the Christian Imagination by Willie Jennings, I was just shocked to see all of the theology that was created to support the colonial, mm -hmm. you know, enterprise of conquest. Mm -hmm. And of course, this has also been documented. There's a lot of thought theology that was created to support slavery. You know, the side. Oh, of totally. Yeah. yeah, we didn't and, even mention that. Yeah. 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 yeah so. So on this topic of books, you know, there's a thousand books out there, especially now mm -hmm. on related topics. But in and as I there's as I said, there's not much on white theology itself. But if you were to kind of help people to get on a trajectory to learn about whiteness and its impact on theology, what are some books that you would suggest people look at? Well, the one that Werner mentioned, I think uh is to me the most significant book I've read in the last 10 years. I mean, it it was, it mm -hmm. was a, whenever I have a book that I wrote in almost as much as the author wrote in, that's like, that is a book that <laughs> I, mean, I, it was just paid. Yeah, it's Christian imagination. Yeah, the, the that's the what Christian you're referring imagination to, right? is just jaw dropping. And, and it's like, mm -hmm. I sort of think about things before and after that book. I can, I can track my thought. That's mm -hmm. a powerful one. I think if you're going to pick it up and read it, you've got to give yourself months because it's 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 um it's sort of a theology in a different discourse, and it's one of the most beautifully written books that I've read. I was profoundly moved by it. Uh, Cameron Carter's book, J. Cameron Carter's book, Theology and Race, 
Uh, and that that also is a very heavy book, very thick. These are two very learned uh, black theologians that are um, just the, the command of material that they have is just impressive. There's a there's a book. I'm, I'm, I know the people that participated in this book and I've seen a couple of the lectures. So I'm assuming that the rest of it's really credible. But there was a book called uh, Can White People Be Saved? And um, mm. kind of mm. a provocative title and uh, published published yeah. by IVP. But some of those in there are just really, really uh, great pieces of work. And that might introduce you to some new theologians, some um, Black and Latina theologians that um, will bring some different voices into play. I th- I'm ass- On the Cameron Carter book, were you, uh, I was looking that up, were you talking about race and theological accounts? Yeah, sorry. Yeah, that's the one. Yeah. Okay. And I, I, I guess I, I'm having a little bit of brain lock here, but I would say all good. Um, what I would do is get IVP, IVP's catalog. Um, they are publishing <laughs> just so much great stuff yeah. on this right now from yeah. a range of great perspectives. Sorry, I can't believe I didn't mention this. Esau McCauley's book, Reading While Black, is an excellent oh, yeah. book. And he's so accessible. And he's, oh, he's, a, he's, a, he's a, so good. Yeah, he's a great writer, great theologian, biblical scholar. There's another one by, um, it was just published by Baker Academic. Uh, I can see his face, but I can't think of his name. I, it might might be called like Race in the Kingdom of God or something like that. Um, well, look, I'll look uh, that. Uh, Jarvis Williams. And we'll put all Jarvis this... Williams, oh, okay. his brand new book. Yeah. yeah so there, there's a, I'm sorry, I'm not being more helpful. No, no, no. That's good. No, this is good. You know, Jamar Tuesday's book, The Color of Compromise. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, and then how how not to be racist. So Jamar Tisby's written a couple of good books, and hopefully he just keeps pumping it out. There's, I tell you, one of the most helpful things from Shaniqua Walker Barnes, her book, I Bring the Voices of My People, just a a, a black theologian. Uh, she's a womanist theologian. Great book, powerful, powerful book. Yes, that uh, that's Willie Jennings' new book, Warner After Whiteness where he's sort of, and it's, it's probably a lot more accessible than the Christian imagination, but where he reconceives of um, of uh, theological education. And it's just really interesting. And, and he, he is doing the work of expanding the imagination to see how it might be different than it is. And I think that that's the project that we all have to embark on. Um, I think... Even beyond books, I would just, you know, YouTube anything that Willie Jen, any talk Willie Jennings has given, Esau McCauley, um, Shanique yeah. Walker Barnes, any any of these thinkers that, um, you know, they can be good models and, and be, you know, get podcasts. You know, somebody uh, that's a worthy conversation partner I found is James Cohn. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, while he would be, you know, foreign waters for a lot of conservative evangelicals that I know. Uh, I found that when you're reading his stuff, you get a very clear contrast of emphases mm. compared to the white theology that you read. Sure. Uh, it's very, very, whether you agree with him or not, you see he's very grounded in the concrete, mm-hmm. the here, the now, and why does the Bible matter for our situation? Yeah. And it's a whole different feel. And so yeah. whether or not you agree with all his conclusions or not, it really does present a, an alternative way yeah. to think through your processing. Yeah, no, absolutely. I, uh, um, yeah, should read more cone. Also, I just thought of another while you were talking. Oh. Well, that's all right. Well, if you think of all others, right. feel free to email them. We'll put them in the show notes for everybody. Cool. A lot of good resources out there. Just absolutely. Start, just start exploring. Well, our last question we always ask people before we go is, is essentially this, because we're doing theology thinking mission. And it's a broad question, so you can answer however you want. What does theology have to learn from missions? And what does missions have to learn from theology? And you're a New Testament guy, so maybe you'll want to you know, focus a little bit more on New Testament. Wow. Yeah, I, to my mind, theology has to learn from mission that theology, unless, unless we feel in our bones on the front lines of mission and ministry, that this the, that theology is compelling and relevant. If we have to ask, how is this theology relevant? Then it's not theology. Mm. Mm. Wow. You know, what are we What are we doing? We're wasting our time with formulations. To my mind, theology is is theology is the set of discussions we have as we're on mission and in ministry. It's not these the formulations about abstractions. It's it's the 
It's the talk that we talk as we're doing mission and ministry. So theology, I think, has to be disciplined and constrained by its need to justify itself. If, if it's if it's just in academies doing talk, doing God talk, and people are you know spending semester after semester wondering how this is ever going to be relevant in the context they'll be in, then it is we've got to come to grips with the reality that it's a waste of time and. What what do you what does mission need to learn from theology? I think that mission needs to learn that it always needs to be elevating its use of language as it has the conversation about what it's doing. That I mean, that's good theology. Is like, are we are we because words matter because words shape how we see the world. They shape us. They shape um, who we think we are. What we think we're doing. Um, so just just the grammatical, the, the change in the logic of saying we need to get out there and be the hands and feet of Jesus to the world. Mm. Now, that's something you cannot find that in the New Testament. That's not language that is used. The, bo- the metaphor for the body in the church is, is when the body gathers, it's a collection of body parts. Mm. Um, but when the church thinks about doing mission, like going back to Mark 9, it thinks in terms of coming into contact with other people and being blessed by them and, and experiencing yeah. Jesus among them. Not to say that pagans yeah. have pagans are going to give us Christianity. I'm not saying that. But when we make contact, that's when we experience the presence of Jesus. So mission needs to learn from theology to have always better talk as it's talking about what it's doing. And it seems to me that theology needs to learn from mission that if it's if it's not uh, having the conversation about what we're doing, then we're not mm. doing theology. Yeah. What a perfect way to end. Uh, Tim, thanks for joining us, man. And uh, sorry for the technical difficulties we had earlier. I'm glad uh, that we were able to get back on. Uh, I think our readers. Yeah, thanks for having me. This was great. It was really enlivening and compelling. Absolutely. And I really hope this conversation catalyzes a lot of people to continue the conversation so for all you listeners out there uh we have uh the list of books in the show notes tell us friends about this get more people talking about the conversation go on uh, apple uh, or wherever you listen to podcasts leave a review leave comments and start a conversation there thanks again guys see you next time 